have all voted. It being 131 eyes and 16 nays, Senate Bill 1 is finally passed. Nearly 16 hours of debate, packed with partisan jabs and a few angry confrontations, all to set up the next round in the Texas budget battle. Good morning and thank you for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Josh Hinkle. Early Friday morning, the Texas House approved a budget plan for the next two years, but the battle is just beginning. House lawmakers took on several controversial ideas as they considered nearly 400 amendments to the budget. One vote took money from the Texas Enterprise Fund. That's a program championed by Governor Greg Abbott. The money is used for incentives to encourage economic development in Texas. House lawmakers wanted to take $43 million from the fund and spend it instead on child protective services and a program to pay for therapy services for disabled children. Another House amendment would forbid the state from diverting tax dollars from public schools to families who want to spend it on private or home schools. House members approved the ban by a vote of 103 to 44. That goes against a school choice bill already passed by the Senate. Another big difference between the House and Senate budget plans is how each chamber plans to come up with money to cover a projected shortfall in state revenue. We use uh, the Economic Stabilization Fund to find $2.5 billion, and the Senate has utilized uh, some maneuver with state highway funds in order to find that $2.5 billion. And so that, that's a pretty big difference, but it's one that I think that we'll easily be able to figure out in conference. There's still a long process ahead. The conference that Representative Zerwas refers to is the Budget Conference Committee. That's made up of five members from the House and five members from the Senate. They'll go through the budget line by line to resolve the every difference. And at the end, they bring it back to the full Senate and the full House. In order for a budget to pass, both sides have to pass exactly the same document. For perspective on the budget battle, we turn to our roundtable. Mike Ward is with the Austin Bureau Chief for the Houston Chronicle. Jim Malowitz is the investigative reporter for the Texas Tribune. Welcome. Thanks. Hey. Were you guys up pretty late for the budget battle? A light night. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, I, mean, I think it wrapped up around uh, 2 o'clock in the morning or so. What does this one compare to in previous sessions? It's gone pretty late before. This was actually, uh, it's gone late, but this was actually an early cutoff. Uh, I've been around for a while, but I've seen it go until 4 or 5 in the morning, sometimes even later. Right, and, and I guess we were, we were inching to, uh, uh, they were very slow in, in the um, in, in the early stages, and then kind of at the end, um, they moved a bunch of amendments right to the end of the budget and kind of called it a night. So, What was the big moment of the night that you noticed? Well, uh, there were several dust-ups between representatives on various issues. Uh, the real bottom line coming out of this is the House has now got their budget, the Senate's got their budget, so now the real work starts trying to get these two budgets worked together, welded together for the final version that they've got to have before the end of May. So now we kind of figure out who's going to be on this conference committee, right? Because mm -hmm. you've got five people from the House, five people, people from the Senate. Typically, who are those people? Are they close to the Speaker? Are they close to the Lieutenant Governor? Um, yeah, yeah, they're sort of the top dogs on, on, on both sides of the, um, um, you know, b b both sides of the, the chamber. And um, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see what shakes out, too, because um, the House you know, last night sent some uh, pretty strong messages on things like uh, school choice, um, kind of overwhelmingly saying no to that, and that's something that the Senate really backs. Um, and also, um, they stripped some money from uh, the governor's uh, Texas Enterprise Fund, sort of the deal-closing fund, um, sort of sending some sort of message there, too. They sent that to CPS. So um, that's maybe something that the, the Senate might take issue with. Yeah, I can't imagine he's going to be happy about that. That one. He's not going to be happy. The lieutenant governor had asked the House to vote on school choice, so they voted now, and he's probably not real happy with how they voted, but, you know, <laughs> so it goes. You know, the House and the Senate, money-wise, are only about $500 million apart on their two budgets. Where the big difference is, and this will be the key of negotiations, is how to pay for it, whether you take money from the rainy day fund, whether you don't, uh, whether you do some accounting tricks, either the House version or the Senate version. That's what will be the key on negotiations. Right, right. And the, the House um, budget right now would, would take about $2.5 million from that rainy day fund, which is basically the, the fund we have uh, when, when times are rough like they are right now. And that's something that many people don't want to touch. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. So let's shift our gears to our former governor, who is now the nation's energy secretary and the newest member of the National Security Council. Who would have thought? 
Hey, you know, what did I say? <laughs> Never underestimate estimate Rick Perry. Right. It's been it's been quite a journey from uh, you know the the 2012 Oops campaign to another failed campaign for president in uh, 2016 to uh, Energy Secretary and now National Security Council. What's his credentials for that? I mean, I know the Energy Department has some stuff to do with nuclear weapons. That's relatively new to him, though. Maybe the border security stuff that he had to deal with back as governor. Well, uh, he's got a lot of experience, executive experience. Uh, he's not a Nobel laureate or a lot of the other credentials that other people who have been energy secretary have, but uh, he's now on the National Security Council, so we'll kind of see how this plays forward. Right, and um, you know, traditionally um, the energy secretary hasn't been on that, that council um, in uh, recent years, but um, as the way as it was originally drawn up, um, it was sort of envisioned for the energy secretary to be on that council because they oversee the uh, nuclear weapons arsenal, and so um, the credential, I guess, could be in the title. And he's just not as controversial as some of the other members have been um, right. in this short administration so far. Right, but President Trump is writing a new playbook for a lot of things in D.C. right now, and I would suggest this is the latest chapter. <laughs> for sure. When someone like Governor Perry, um, Secretary Perry, gets to be in this kind of position, does this put him um, you know, on the stage for a possible move up in power in the future? You know, that's been suggested already, uh, and I've also seen all the stories about his grades at A&M and how he got an F in meets or something, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, I would repeat what I've said earlier, never underestimate Rick Perry. You never can tell. Yeah. He's, he's been through a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Well, thank you guys both for being with us. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. You bet. Thank we got, you. We got just a couple of, what was it, like six weeks left in the... In the session, I guess six or seven weeks. Six or seven weeks. Fasten your seatbelt. Budget's going to be a key thing, but there's infinite amounts of other issues to argue about. School choice, bathrooms, go on down the list. It'll be entertaining. All right, we'll have to have you back.